Hey, I'm Jake Jackson. I'm here with Spitfire to discuss uh, Joe Trapanese's score for Robin Hood and the kind of technical and orchestral layout. So for a traditional orchestra layout and for all the Albions and the symphonic strings and everything like that, it's a, essentially, if you think about it, it's a semicircle. And then you have little segments of a semicircle, like a pie chart, essentially. And so for the first violins, they kind of would go in this way. So you'd have chairs here, chairs here, chairs here, chairs here, chairs here. The first violins, maybe 12. So they'd be in this kind of, this kind of little you know, section of the pie chart. And that's why you need the outriggers, which would traditionally be kind of here with the trees there. The second violins would be next to them in this. So they're pointing there to by the conductor out like this. Violas would be in this little section and then celli over here. And then the basses, they kind of nestle in between behind the celli because they often play in octaves with the celli. So they need to be able to hear the celli and kind of around there. And then you'd have the brass set up. <coughs> so it takes the same amount of space, but it's a very different layout. What Joe doesn't like about that particular setup, you have some players near the front of the tree where the sound is and you have some further away. So you're not getting all of the sound at the same time, but also the people at the front, you hear louder than the people at the back. So we were like, I mean, ahhing about whether to have them in a big, long row all the way around, in a big semicircle, basically, all the way around, big semicircle, and have the second violins behind them in a big semicircle. We decided that that was too, they were too far away from each other. You know, the person sat over there is to get the physical distance between where they're sat is a lot. They're used to being within, you know, a, you know, a meter of like maybe four or five within a square meter of them. We decided to bunch them together. So this became our first violins. The leader sat over here and then they so they're all kind of can see each other a little bit. They're all sit with desk partners. They kind of got their, their wadge of sound, which actually is great because then you get a wadge of sound pretty much arriving at the same time at the room mics, which is what, what you want, which is, you know, which is why I think this sound is really exciting because you got all that presence together rather than one person being, you know, maybe what, about five or six meters away from each other, which is in musical terms, a few, quite a few milliseconds. So here they're all much closer, much tighter, and they're coming, you know, together <laughs> towards the tree, which is up there. For the second violins, we then just thought, well, let's just mirror them. The traditional orchestra layout we've talked about, but there is a, another way of doing it where you would have the first and second violins in their little section, their little pies, little se section of pies on each side. Um, and that's kind, of that's kind of traditional way of setting an orchestra to some degree as well. So we've kind of mirrored that again by having the second violins over here. So here's our second violins, all the same thought process that went into the first violins comes here. So when you move the instruments from where their current positions, they're designed to a certain degree to be played a certain way. So if you think about a violin, imagine this is a violin, it's like that is the shape of the instrument. So actually it's not ideal having them here because it's kind of going that way rather than that way. So they kind of switch themselves so they're a bit like kind of this, so it's going towards the things. They're not sat straight on, they're kind of all, these chairs are pointing as, towards the conductor, but they were all sat slightly like this. So you've got that kind of projection towards the microphones. When they're sat over here, for example, on the kind of slightly more, the kind of the backup traditional way of doing it, if they're sat here in their thing, then of course they're completely facing the wrong direction from the audience, which is why some composers don't like to do it with first and second violins, like sat like this. And that's why the celli are here, because they've got, they kind of, they've got their, you think the celli is a big soundboard that way, then you'll hear it's kind of going towards the tree. And violas, who are normally sat there, where the camera is, um, they, they sit with their thing, but they're used to sitting here, so they kind of, again, used to angling, angling away. So it's just kind of little, you know, all these tiny little things, but they all, you know, make a difference to where you put the microphones and, yeah. and where you sit the players. So that was that. So that was the first and second violins, which was the idea was to not have them too near the tree so they could play out and play really aggressively when they need to or, you know, lyrically when they need to without hearing that real bright presence. And then we just thought about the violas and celli and Joe wanted the presence from the celli. So we put them here in this front row. And then we had the violas here. There's a couple more celli here and then more uh, violas there. And that gave us the, a little kind of ring of a ring of power, power rings of each of each of these. Um, and it, they all arrive at the same time together up to here to, to up the back of the room to the very back of so the, the three different trees we had set up. This tree, the tree 
and then the one behind the back. So it gave us, again, everything's coming at the same time there, which gives a really interesting different sound. I, th I, think, I think the viola found it the hardest because they were the most displaced from each other because all the celli were here and they could see each other. You know, you had one cellist here, one cellist over there, they could really see each other. So I think they probably found it the nicest to play because they really could see each other and hear each other. The violas found it hard because one was here and then one would be like, you know, five or six meters right over there, you know, like, so the communication was quite hard, you know. You know, talking to each, talking to each other, but um, at least they had they had friends next to each other, so they could talk about it. Often the low energy gets a bit lost, but because it was also present and close to the mic, the closest to the mics, you kind of really felt that energy. Some of it might be psychological, so why not be? I mean, that's the great thing is, you, is that people can listen to the soundtrack now and see what they think. You know, they can listen to Robin Hood and they can compare it against some other people. You know, some other style, similar style of music, even some of Joe's other other scores, and 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 here. The difference and see see what you think for yourself, you know. Um, but we really found we found it, the energy much more alive, and I think really having all of the musicians, you know, each section of the sound arriving at the same time, we found really, really was the powerful thing, really, because it felt much more in time. You know, everything felt tighter rhythmically because of that. And I think that was the main breakthrough on it. You definitely lost um, some of that kind of traditional sound of like the kind of real width and spread of having the highs on the left and the lows on the right. For a film score, actually, it kind of really works because it just, it's just kind of got that kind of real homogenous sound that's kind of really nice. We also discussed where to put the basses and traditionally when this kind of style of moving the, the orchestra around, the basses just tend to go in the middle because that's just kind of the way, it's, the way it's done. But Alan was quite anti that and um, I haven't done it any other way. So I was like, okay, great, let's listen to it. And I loved the sound of what we did with the basses. So the basses went into these spare, into these spare, spare little corners we've got over here. So we had five basses here, which gave the real width of, of bass and here, yeah. and again, the other side. That was a really interesting sound because again, because they were in a group, they kind of sounded nice, but then you had this kind of lovely, cool left and right kind of bass richness. It didn't muddy up the bass in the middle again, which is kind of quite nice. I mean, traditionally you put the bass down the middle and it's that, but I guess because it would have to be so wide because it was 10 bases. And if you had them width wise, that's actually take up a huge amount of space. And this was kind of cool because it just had, it just sounded really wide and really kind of like cool. And then for the brass, we did a kind of similar thing really. Again, it was a big brass section. We had 12 horns, uh, six trombones, two tubers. So we split the horns in half. We put six horns this side. And we had six horns the opposite side. And again, they're kind of, they, you know, that's, that, is, that has been done a few times before. Traditionally, they're raised so they can see over the top of the violins. Kind of, they're just used to being up there. I mean, so again, it just helps project because they go backwards, essentially. I mean, this room is nice for that because they've got something to bounce, the, the, they can reflect straight away off the wall, which is nice. Again, it's just to help raise their sound just above, because all these seats, the, we didn't do the strings and brass together. If you do, then you definitely want to have them raised because it just helps that. But even the chairs being here does, absorb some of the sound. So just having a little bit higher just gives that, that, just that extra bit of just floatiness over the top, let's say. And then we had the trombones down the middle. So you've got the six trombones, four trombones, two bass trombones, two tubers who doubled chimbassos. So you've got, you know, this big wall of sound coming at you. Again, they ended up having to be quite a long way away from the tree, but we had our alternate microphone pickups to give us a kind of close up if we wanted that. That, that I really liked because that meant that you can just get that kind of force of the trombones who are loud and, and bright. And I've done other sessions like this before where we've split the horns. You sort of have the trumpets and the trombones. And I really like the sound of the, the brass coming down the middle. If you have it kind of more traditionally, the trumpets on the right hand side, then it becomes really kind of distracting. It can become distracting, not all the time, of course, but it, you know, for this kind of style of score, having that kind of power down the middle gave it a real kind of edge and bite. Because it was a, a new setup, you know, we could experiment with, mic, mic, with miking, which is actually really exciting. We had the traditional tree and the outriggers and the ambience and like, you know, and the close mics, which is what, you know, the Spitfire users will know from, from the sample libraries. But we had, we, we added, you know, we amended things like the mid microphones. We actually ended up having uh, like a kind of, we, had, we ended up having lots of different, you know, trees in inverted commas, different versions of trees. The tree here, you've got Alan's TNM170 tree. My gallery tree is about here. And then you can see where I've positioned the, Microphones. So this is the outriggers here. There's the ambience or surround microphones there. Tree. And these are the spot mics. These ones, the orange ones. 
And then these green ones are the uh, mid. So we had like the mid LCR for the tree for the strings, outriggers for the strings kind of things. And then we had these kind of mid pickups for the brass. So like a kind of overall kind of like front front. Well, not really that. They were kind of like a front horn thing. And you can see all the spot mics. So there's a lot of microphones as you can see, a lot of microphones. But and the sound you get is a real blend of all of these various tree mics we had. We had the traditional M50s, you know, the, the kind of ones that everybody knows and hearing, you know, have been used on 99% of all film scores forever. Very traditional um, thing. This is the, de the Decca tree, which people can look up if they want to understand why it's in this situation. Uh, this, then on this, for Alan's tree, we had uh, TLM 170s in Omni, I think. Um, again, that was um, you know, the so Neumann large mic, di diaphragm mic again. Again, at this point, we're using microphones we wouldn't necessarily use because we're kind of you know pushing the boundaries and don't normally have all of those set it. So that was quite a nice sound. And they're nice tree. They're quite a bit more modern sounding, but still got the Neumann sound to them, which is nice. And again, the tree right up in the gallery, again, was another Neumann. And this time it was the uh, TLM 50s, which is a kind of more modern version of the M 50s, um, but without the valves and without everything else. But again, they've been used on a tree for a long time as well. You know, another, another alternate go-to mic. So again, Omni, large capsule, kind of round capsule, similar capsules to the M50, in fact. And then that was that. And then I think for the mids, I used um, the, you know, my usual mid mics, which are maybe, I think, UM900s or something like that. So kind of a bit more modern sound and not as high, but just there as a kind of overall pickup. But yeah, so we listened to the sound. We had, did a couple of rehearsals, came through, did a quick recording. Joe came in, had a listen, was really excited, really happy with it. Bar a few musicians who were, found it quite difficult, you know, to communicate with their desk, you know, other desks. The, the, the result was very positive. And, if, and in fact, at the end of the, we finished a little bit early. And so we just did a couple of other alternates just for our future reference. We moved, we ended up actually swapping the cellos and violas around. So we had cello, viola, cello, viola, and things like that around the front there, kept the violins where they were. But just to see what that sounded, if that sounded any different. But it didn't, wasn't quite as homogenous. It didn't quite, didn't quite work as well. The musicians were actually even more upset by that. You know, the communication between the violas was probably the hardest, was the big thing that kind of came out the most. Maybe between the first and the second violins was a big difference because they're used to being within like a metre and a half of each other. And this thing, they were like three or four metres away. So they found that quite difficult. Because when the violins, there's quite a lot of communication that goes between the violins in terms of bowing, and if they're playing in unison or they're playing in octaves or whatever, you know, they play often play the same thing. So that was quite hard. But we factored in extra time for the recording for that. We were generally doing two sessions of strings and then a session of brass in the evening, I think. For an hour of, hour of session time, you can record eight minutes of, of a finished cue, essentially. You know, Joe's music is quite a lot of ostinatos and, and that kind of stuff. And, if you're playing that loud, it's energetic and you need a bit of rest. So that's quite a nice way of another reason for splitting it up. I think a lot about the job is technical and it's a lot about it is about relationships because you're particularly if you're standing out on, a, on the podium, you need to trust um, the team around you to make sure they deliver it for you. So I think as an engineer, you've got to have that kind of warmth of personality that people can feel they can trust you immediately. It becomes a relationship between myself, the composer and the musicians. I think it's really important to have that kind of that relationship with people and to you know, the great thing about being a runner here at air for you know five years first five years of my career being a runner in a tape up or then to 10 years i did before i was an engineer was that i had the relationship with the orchestra so i can come out into the orchestra move the microphones around have a joke have a josh you know like you know and, and you know give them exactly what they want so then you've got that relationship with them when you're the engineer and you need to say to them look we need to do another take i know you're tired it's like five to nine everyone wants to go home we've been playing since 10 a.m we're all tired, but look, we just need one more take. And it's, I know it's a very subtle difference, but we need to do it. Please do it one more time. And also I can be, you know, I can give them a critique. Um, you know, that bit wasn't in tune, that bit wasn't together. And I think having that relationship really helps because it's the respect. I respect them and they respect me, which is really nice.